Good evening, Berlin. So, um, you know, first of all, Max, thank you. When, when, when I hear expert, I hear I'm getting old. Um, Secondly, uh, you know, there was a crazy idea, uh, and as I always say to the team, ideas are cheap, it's all about execution, uh, was, you know, G4A has been uh, an amazing digital health KOL brand. And Livongo has been watched very closely as one of the first big digital health IPOs. So the crazy idea came and said, you know, why don't we, can we get Glenn over here, right? How do we, as a founder, go from initial product offering to initial public offering? And so when I said execution is key, I've met Glenn a number of times, but I figured he's not going to remember me shit from Shinola, right? So who do I call? So I called Jess DeMassa from WTF Health, who is back there doing interviews, connected, and next thing I know, John and Glenn are on the phone, and we're here. So it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Glenn to stage. And uh, I was told by John I can ask you, please. <laughs> I was told by John that um, we're going to have some fun on the stage. We can. We can. we can. Excellent. So first of all, welcome to Deutschland. Thank you. And first time to Berlin, I think. First time to Berlin. First time to Berlin. Excited to be here. Uh, secondly, congrats on the Fed contract. And Thank hence you. come the question, so you got the federal government, you got a long way to go to U.S. Aside from an introduction from Jessica, why are you here in Europe with us? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say it's, uh, it's great to be here, and I applaud all of the entrepreneurs that I saw present. They were great, and uh, Stefan, thank you. I think you're over there, if I can see through the lights. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here at uh, Bayer, so thank you for that. Why? Um, so I always think you have to mix some fun with some business, number one. Number two, um, John, who runs our communications, always looks at what are the best conferences where you're going to run into meaningful people. And so it was a combination of best conference. Stefan and I had had, had occasion to meet over the years. And, uh, and then last but not least, I hadn't been to Berlin. And I was excited to come. So all those right. things together. And so here we are. Welcome, welcome. Um, so I'm going to rewind back all the way in the Wayback Machine. Um, you know, you and your partner is part of the Seven Wire. You invest. Uh, but Livanga was a bit of a different beast. In a sense, you decided to spin this up. What, you know, as the three of you or more were sitting in the room and said, what made you actually spin this up uh, as a company? Um, and what made you actually you know, go into this space? Well, I think uh, there's, there's always multiple factors that go into any kind of startup. So, you know, one piece of it was I'm fairly sure that my partners wanted to get me out of the day-to-day -day fund. So that was, <laughs> that was uh, one consideration. Second is there's a very personal involvement that I had with diabetes, and that's where, for those who don't know uh, Livongo, that's where we started. Today, we have a whole person platform. We focus on diabetes, on hypertension, on weight management, diabetes prevention, behavioral health. But when we started, it was just diabetes. And I had had um, um, an experience. My son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 8 years old. He's now 24. And when he was diagnosed, I made a commitment to him that we would find a cure. And, you know, as the years ticked on, I realized that we had to focus also on keeping him healthy until we did. And so when the opportunity five years ago presented itself to actually jump into the business and really right some of the wrongs that exist in our healthcare system today um, in terms of how difficult we make it for people with chronic conditions to live a healthy life. And, you know, it's amazing, particularly in the U.S., that everywhere people with chronic conditions turn, there's a hurdle. There's co-pays and there's limitations and there's restrictions on care. And, you know, so what we wanted to do was create something that actually made it easier to stay healthy, and that became Livongo. And interestingly, the name, as we surveyed people with diabetes and other chronic conditions, they said two things. They said, one, we just want to live our life. We just, we didn't want this chronic condition, this disease. We just want to live our life, and we're on the go. So don't give us any solutions that force us to go to a hospital, to a doctor's office, or wherever, 
So hence, Livongo, living on the awesome. go. Uh, how many uh, entrepreneurs in the audience, startups? Can you just raise your hands real quick? Quite, quite a few. It's hard to see there, but I see a bunch of hands. So par part of it, as you develop and grow the business, uh, there's always you know, some level of pivots. Uh, you're not, you don't get where you are already today without some of the pivots and aha moments. Mm -hmm. So if you rewind back a bit, what were some of the major sort of small turns, big turns, or big aha moments for you as a business? Well, so above my, my desk, uh, there's a sign that says, every day the world turns upside down on someone who thought they were sitting on top of it. And so I kind of come in, and I think as, as the CEO or as a founder, you should come in expecting something to go wrong. Because if it doesn't, the business is at a point where um, it's running well, and they probably don't need you. So every day, it's just it's this function of what's it going to be today? What are they going to throw at us? In, in particular, in starting this business, we changed virtually everything about the existing experience. And in doing that, we upset a lot of people. For example, the people who sell strips in the United States, that's a very profitable business. And we had this crazy idea that said, we're going to actually give the strips away, and we're going to make them unlimited. And we're going to tell people that they only cost a few dollars. They don't really cost $50. They don't really cost a dollar strip. That upset a lot of people who basically were trying to kill us for the first few years. And then, all of a sudden, because people, and particularly large self-insured employers, are so upset with the healthcare system that they're really willing to try anything, a lot of those people, when they tried to kill us, they said, look, you've never given us a solution that works well, so we're going to stay with Livongo. And then there was this flip where all of a sudden they said, we weren't really trying to kill you. We really love you, and we'd like to be <laughs> partners with you. And we'd like to help you distribute your product. So, so that was a, a real, you know, a board-level discussion of saying, like, there's a lot of people trying to go into our customers and saying, if you use Livongo, we will actually increase other costs to you to keep you from using Livongo, which is... Illegal, but you know who's going to sue these big companies? So, you know we had to figure out how we how we navigate that. And even today, you know everybody really doesn't want to drive down cost. Yep. And so as we do that across the business, um, you know that is a challenge. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting you were describing some of these problems, and I just saw a tweet the other day that, you know, as a startup founder, you have, you f we wake up to 99 problems, you solve maybe 36 of them, and then next morning there's 99 again, right? So I think the days go and keep going. Um, and, you know, you started talking about the strips and obviously impact, and, you know, I've seen you speak around um, health uh, and the experiences and changing that. Uh, what's the impact of your company to your clients, but also the outcomes? Because some of the, the toughest things are behavior modifications and changes. Sure. So if you can talk a little, expand a little bit of how you guys are doing it, what's the approach? Well, well, so the first thing is, as we look at businesses, we always look at three things. One, does the ultimate user, does the member love it, not like it? Because in today's environment, like is an invitation to get replaced. You're just preparing for someone else to come in with a better product. So, one, do they love it? And our net promoter score is in the 60s compared with an industry that's used to 5 to 10. So, so that's one thing that we, we focus incessantly on. You know, the second piece of that is you have to be able to demonstrate measurable and sustainable clinical outcomes. And that's really important because there's a lot of products out there that fundamentally don't really work. And so you have to, and this is true whether you're a buyer with your medications or whether you're you know, a hospital or whether you're any other healthcare provider. So you have to be able to demonstrate measurable, sustainable results. And then last but not least, you actually do have to save money. So particularly where technology is involved, in every industry where technology is used appropriately, it actually does improve the experience and reduce the cost except in healthcare. Somehow we seem to avoid that rule. Yeah. And so we look at, when we look at acquiring a company, when we look at investing it, and for Lavago, every question we ask is, if we can't do it and check off all three of those, we probably shouldn't enter that business. So that's the way we've done it, and we've been able to demonstrate that. 
think from our perspective, the other thing we look at is this idea of consumer empowerment. And you notice I didn't say engagement, and it's funny because when I speak to hospital executives, you know, I say, do you have an engagement program? And every one of them raises their hands and says, oh, yeah, we do. And I say, how is it working? That's not really working that well. And the reason well, is, one. well, yeah, <laughs> well, they have one, but having one may actually be worse, not better. Because if you call people with a chronic condition, and, you know, I, like my son used to get these calls, and he'd be sitting in class or whatever, and he'd get a call in the middle of the day, and they'd say, this is your health plan. We know you have diabetes, and we're sorry because we know you could, could lead to blindness or amputation. He'd be like, who is this, and why are they calling me? And then he'd ask them simple questions, and they couldn't actually help. So he really said, why are they calling? And in a similar way, I think that's the question. So, so I think that what we want to do is put people back in charge of their care because particularly in the U.S., health care is done to you, and we want to get that back to where you're in charge of your own health care. And, you know, um, as, as you guys launched the business and grown the business, um, you know, some kind of started saying, well, that's another disease management program. But at the end of the day, you guys actually created a new category. So maybe you can talk a little bit about... The, the category and how you explain this to the market. Sure. Well, I'm not sure we did a wonderful job explaining it to the market, but with any category, you know, the challenge is always, you know, people look for comps. Are you, what do you like? So with us, they said, well, you have coaches. You're a coaching company. No, we're not really a coaching company. Well, you have this innovative cellular-enabled device. You're a device company. No, we're not really a device company. Well, you have more data scientists than you have computer you know, mm -hmm. programmers, developers. So you're a data science company. No, we're not really that. What we are is we're an experience company. We're changing the experience of what it's like to have a chronic condition. So people didn't really understand that, and I'm not sure they still understand that they will. You know, the other piece of that is we have something called AIAI, and that is we're actually using data science, but you know, AI is very overused. Everybody says, well, we do AI. And in fact, everybody kind of does a little bit of AI. But what we do is we call it AI AI because we have an engine that we, like everyone else, we aggregate all the information. And that could come from our own devices. It could come from a continuous glucose monitor. It could come from your pharmacy records, your health records, an electronic health record. All that information could come from your Apple Watch, it could come from your Samsung Watch, your Fitbit, wherever it is, we get all, gather all that, we aggregate that information. Then we interpret that information to say, what does it mean to Eugene versus Stefan versus someone else? And now we have that information, but the trick is, then you have to apply it. That's that third A, AI, AI. And you have to see, did it work? So if we tell you to do something, did you actually do it, and did it lead to positive results? Mm -hmm. Now, the people who do this well, you know, Amazon, because Amazon sends me a list, it's very frustrating, and they say, here's the books that people like you are going to like to read and that you want to read. I look at the list, and I say, damn it, I have to read these books. <laughs> so I buy the books, and I realize I don't have time. Then I go to Audible, and I download the books and listen to them on 2X or 3X when I'm running, and I try to get through all the books, but they have figured out what works for me, which is different than what works yep. for other people. So they personalize that response. They've done it in a timely way, and they get me to change my behavior. And so what we said is, why can't we do that same thing in healthcare? So all this data science investment is going into A-B testing, where we're not only giving people back a number, for example, in diabetes or in hypertension, but we're giving them back real-time coaching and information, then, then we see if it works. And does it lead to sustained, measurable behavior change? And the great news is that we actually see that in, in 40 to 60% of the time, they will do what we ask them to do. And because it works, and they see that, and they see it works. So I'm going to ask you this question, which I'm sure that if you had a penny every time somebody asked you this, you probably can start the next company already with it. What actually made you go IPO? It comes sure. with its own big challenges and, uh, <laughs> and tribulations. Well, when we, so this is, this is not, maybe it's a warning, but you know, I always say to people, and I said to people before our IPO, um, the best day of going public is the day you go public. And after that, it's all downhill. 
And so we went public and our stock went up and everybody said, well, I think you were wrong. And I said, well, so here's what happens when you go public. One, you get thousands of new bosses. <laughs> and every one of those people thinks they know how to run your company better than you do. So then the second thing is you become subject to people thinking you are your stock price. Yeah. And, you know, that's just not true. And related to that, there's all kinds of external factors. You know, we have a crazy person in Washington who can move the market. <laughs> um, and um, uh, you maybe just we have went a lot, there. I maybe, love it. <laughs> maybe we have a lot of crazy people in Washington, but, <laughs> but, um, but who can move the market that is independent of what you're doing. So your people scratch their head and they say, well, I think we're doing well, but the stock price might not be going in the right direction. So what's happening? So all those things are challenges that you have to have. Now, the flip side of that is, so why do you go public? So we went public because we said, we want to create and identify and be the leader in not only doing the first consumer digital health IPO, but that is actually at scale. Um, but we wanted to create this new category, and we didn't want somebody else to actually screw it up. And so creating this applied health signals category was really important to us. And it was important to a lot of our clients who say, we like the fact that public companies are transparent, they like the fact that we're well capitalized, and that they know what's happening at the company. So it was introducing a new category, it's a branding event today, and then last but not least, you know, it's, it's an easy way, it's an easy measurable currency to the extent you want to add things to the platform through acquisition or the like, or maybe even go international someday, if Stefan would help me, I don't know. <laughs> you know that's, the, that's the thing. So what, what is next for Livongo? Where, where is the next big step? Well, you mentioned that we've been fortunate to land uh, some of our largest contracts to date. First and foremost, every company should focus on their core, which is how do you keep your members happy? How do you make sure their experience is a terrific experience? So that's number one. And then you look at growing, and we're growing. You know, our sales were, I think, our last quarter that we reported, our first quarter, was more than 200% up. And um, so growing at a very rapid rate. So first mm -hmm. we have to secure that. Second, we'll continue to expand the platform because it is a whole person platform. You know, our members say, I don't want one coach for my diabetes and one coach for my weight management, and one coach for my hypertension. I want one integrated experience. And that's what we'll deliver for them at Livongo. And so we'll continue to do that. And then last but not least, we will, of course, you know, evaluate markets, whether they be new sectors like government sector, labor sector in the US, whether they be expanding the platform or last but not least, whether they be international. And you know, the metric is that in 10 years, China and India will have more people with diabetes than we have people in the United States. Yeah. And so again, that says to us that this, pro this problem this is not going away, and so we have ample opportunity to grow, and we'll do that around the world with partners that we think understand those local markets. One last question. So we, I raised earlier, you know, how many entrepreneurs in here? You, you've been at it, you know, on the seven wire side, you know, you guys been investing. If you had to pick one advice for the entrepreneurs out here, what would it be? One advice. Just well, one. you know, I think, I think, you know, great companies, and I think somebody said it earlier, are built with great teams. So, and, you know, people are, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. So, what I wouldn't do, I always ask, I was judging a contest recently, and I said to people, what's your exit strategy? And if they had one, I wouldn't invest. Because, you know, I want people who understand that I want them to be passionate about solving a problem. And, and then, if it happens that there's an exit strategy, you know, if buyer wants to come along and say, we'll give you $30 billion, maybe, I don't think so. <laughs> but I don't think so until, until we solve the problem, I wouldn't want to walk away from this. That's how committed we are. Awesome. So I think it's about passion. It's about the opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time coming all thank the way you. out thank to Berlin. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Super. Thanks. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure.